Okay, so, well, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining me. So, my name is Peter Leckbrook, and I'm going to be talking about builds in kind of a generic sense. It's not a deeply technical talk, but it is trying to be thought provoking. And possibly, you know, if you're already a fan of something like Gradle, who's not at the moment, um, it may give you some ideas of how to persuade others that it's worth investigating. So, I've done uh, build myself quite a bit. I am a software developer, but I've always worked pretty much in small companies. If you've ever worked in a small company, you know you pretty much have to do everything. Uh, at some point. You, fin you have fingers in all the pies. So I've always worked with builds, and builds have always felt a little bit like uh, the, the unwelcome relative, that uh, all the focus is on the main uh, stage, it's on the application or library or whatever you're doing, you're selling, that's making all the money. The build, you just don't want to know about it, you just want to build the application, that's where it all is. And this kind of is frustrating because I find build is an important part of the whole software development process. So, I want to start with a little bit of history. Now, I was thinking about this the other day, I was like, okay, so when did building stuff, building software really start? Um, and I could have started at the beginning of the 20th century when you know, what we consider computers to be computers started appearing. But actually, I thought about these musical, automated musical instruments that I've seen in films. I've never seen one in real life. But it basically has a roll of paper with holes in, and you just play that, and it plays a perfect um, musical piece on a piano or harpsichord or um, I don't know what else they work with. Uh, and I thought about this, and I said, well, actually, what we're doing, that piece of paper is a set of instructions, or actually a set of data. In fact, is there a difference between data and instructions? Good question. Lisp, I think, says no. But anyway, this is not a talk about Lisp and data and <laughs> instructions. Um, so let's think of them just as instructions for this machine. So we've actually built a piece of software even though there are no computers involved. Uh, it was also very common with looms, building, uh, you know, creating those weaves, creating rugs and the like. And they would use similar sorts of roles to uh, control the shuttle as it goes across the threads and does the weave, so you can build out interesting patterns without doing it manually. So, you know, this is back in the 18, end of 18th century, this stuff was being done. You could probably go back even further and see examples of building software. But, um, I'm starting here. Then came along punch cards. Now, you may think uh, these are the things that IBM introduced. Well, actually, punch cards were first introduced for looms uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. So, 1801. Uh, a guy called Jacquard introduced punch cards for looms, and they became the Jacquard looms. That's 18th century France, so the French do invent some things. Um, <laughs> uh, any French colleagues in the room? Yes. No, so uh, that was uh, very interesting, that was completely new to me. Uh, and then it was back in 1928 that IBM introduced punch cards for uh, computer type equipment. You still didn't have what you would recognize as a modern computer back then. Um, but these cards, one interesting facet of them, they had 80 columns. So I have finally worked out why I like to keep my code at 80 columns or less. <laughs> it's because of punch cards. Um, because the, that 80 columns was then used for text mode, the maximum limit for uh, MS-DOS text mode and Unix text mode for the terminals. So, uh, you learn some interesting things when you actually try to write a presentation. I recommend it. <laughs> so, these punch cards, uh, imagine doing that by hand, punching holes, and this is you creating your program. So if you think you have it hard right now, 
then feel for the people that were using these things. Uh, eventually, machines were created to try to automate this. So you have key punch machines, which would do it for you. They were like typewriters. But of course, they're still error prone, and you have uh, lots of people dedicated to just typing out your programs. Still got a problem. I mean, every time you press the wrong key, boom, card broken. You've broken the program, card has to go, you have to do it again. And of course, there's another issue. Imagine you've just had all your punch cards created, carrying them in the box, taking some machine, boom! You've just dropped them all on the floor. Um, the order of these cards matters because otherwise your program doesn't run. So you can imagine this poor guy or poor woman has just dropped all of these on the floor going, oh my god, I've got to like collect them all together. And uh, if I'm experienced, I've been writing rubbish on the top of them so that I can see what order they're supposed to be in. Um, fortunately, uh, they, they decided to create machines, which I'll show you next. But actually, Fortran and COBOL started back in the days of punch cards. That's amazing. So programming languages predate um, text editors and magnetic tape. So fortunately there was these machines, pretty big, very expensive, but allowed you to get your program back in order. Uh, very, very useful. Uh, because otherwise it's a manual slow process and error prone. So we're trying to remove, eliminate as much of that manual labor as possible. This is an IBM 082 sorter. There you go. We don't see those no more. And then finally, our savior, magnetism, magnetic tapes and then magnetic disks. And finally, we could write over data, we could rewrite. Uh, and then suddenly we had text editors, and now we enter the modern age of software development. <coughs> Uh, and so now we move into uh, a whole bunch of languages uh, are developing around this time. Uh, I was very much a C, C++ guy, low level. Uh, you take your source, compile it, you get your object files, you link them into executables or shared object libraries or static libs. Um, so it's much easier. Uh, and now we're automating this, these steps of compiling the source into um, object code. Now, of course, you still have to mess around with multiple platforms. Uh, if you've not done this before, read up about it and you will think your life is very easy. I've had to work on a couple of projects where we support Windows, Linux, and some arcane Unix uh, operating systems. AIX, anyone worked with AIX? So, yeah, so was that like the most non unix -y Unix out there that did everything differently? Digital Unix was worse. Digital Unix was worse. Thankfully, I never had any experience with that. So, okay, you win. Um, it was always very, it's like supposed to be a standard, uh, but wasn't very much. Back then, we used Make to build things. Now, Make was a very, very good tool. But there was still a lot of uh, manual stuff involved because you had to tell it which source files were required to build individual object files. Because you can say star.c, every C file creates a corresponding object file, but some of those C files are required for other ones. Every time you change one of the source files, you could be affecting multiple object files. Uh, and so, you have to add multiple of these top lines for lots of individual files. I tell you what, it's error plane, it's horrible, I'm glad I never have to do it again, fingers crossed. Um, and then of course, you have to worry about this. This isn't really relevant to my talk, but I love complaining about this. I said, like, what's this little weight space there? It's a tab, yes. Um, how do you know it's a tab in an old text editor which doesn't show you the actual symbols? You don't, and you spend ages wondering why your build doesn't work. It's because you've got a space in that instead of a tab. Um, anyway, enough complaining. So, then came Java. I tell you what, this made things so much easier. I mean, there were various tools for trying to help you 
work out the dependencies between source files and object files in C. Uh, but Java just did it out of the box. Now I've heard, you know, Java will know exactly which Java files are required to recompile uh, a particular class file. So if a particular source file changes, it knows which class files need to be regenerated. It's very clever stuff. Uh, apparently it's not perfect. I did not know this. Um, I guess I should have assumed it because the number of times I've had to run clean in order to get something to build, that is because Java C is not perfect in determining exactly what files need to be recompiled. But still, it did an amazing job and simplified the whole build system. Um, and so we introduced the jar as a mod unit of module, uh, and then you could create applets, war files, standalone apps. And this was, to me, this was kind of the golden age of building software. Because most of the tools you get out of the box are doing all the work for you. There are very few steps. In fact, it was basically compile, test, package. Back in early days, there was pretty much no publish. It was just, you've got your jar file or uh, application distribution, and you run it. Super. It's kind of changed now. So, uh, builds are a lot more complicated. Um, but it's actually partly because we're trying to incorporate more, automate more stuff. But uh, you may have to deal with deployment, generating docs, of course. Um, John was showing doing JavaScript CSS stuffy that some people like to do. Um, I hate it. But that's part of building a, a web application these days. So it's becoming more complicated. And this raises the question, what is a normal build going to look like in five years' time? You know, it's, been, it's progressed from the days of the punch cards and you know, manually making holes in them to uh, more complex systems where lots of steps are involved. And so, taking that history and thinking about, I, I have no idea what builds are going to look like in five years. Perhaps they're going to look the same. But is your build tool going to be uh, sufficient to actually build that stuff in five years' time? Or is it just going to be a dead weight um, that you're just dragging you along and you just can't make any progress. So to understand that, let's try and think about what is common amongst all of these previous build systems that we've looked at, or previous builds that we've looked at. And I actually want to look at a non-software system. Making tea. No. I'm English, what would you expect? <laughs> So, this is a fairly standard way of making tea. Put water in a kettle, boil it, hopefully empty the teapot before you put any more tea in, and then you put the water in the pot and you brew it for some amount of time. And notice the way this is structured. It's a set of steps. Some steps are required to complete before other steps can start. You know, you should wait for the kettle to boil before you pour the water into the pot with the tea. But others can be run in parallel. Fill kettle, empty pot, there's no connection there. So what we have here is a series of steps, or tasks. Um, and this is kind of the commonality. You know, every build system is actually pretty much like this. A set of steps, some depend on others, some don't. And what you end up with is this acyclic, directed acyclic graph of tasks. Okay, so that is what I would class uh, the fundamental model for a build. It can do anything. I would also like to say, yes, this may be what people think is uh, how you make tea. That is what might be classed a standard build for making tea. For me, I like to do things differently. Uh, I have my reasons, but for me, I just measure a mug's worth of water into a saucepan, boil it on the hop. Why would I boil it on the hop? Why not use a kettle? Because I'm a cheapskate. Gas is cheaper than electricity. Oh, sorry, uh, stove the, the gas rings on top of an oven. Sorry, what's that in US English? Range? Burner. Burner or range. Okay, thank you. Learn something every day. Um, so I'll try to remember that next time I give this talk in the US. Burn up before range. Burn. Okay, so we boil water on 
the burner. Uh, and then once it's boiled, add tea into the saucepan, brew it, and then just drain it out. So I do that because, yes, gas is cheaper. You know, gas is being used to generate your electricity, and then you waste all that electricity going over the wires to your home, uh, and then you lose it in heat and resistance and everything else. Um, it's actually just gas is cheaper than electricity when you get the bill as well. So. Um, plus, you know, if you're going to, um, it's actually much easier to clean a saucepan with tea in it than it is a teapot. Teapots are designed to make it as difficult as possible to clean them out. I have no idea why this is the case, but it is. Anyway, so I have my reasons for doing it this way. A standard process does not mean an exclusive one. I should be able to do it my way, if I've got good reason. There are good reasons to do it the standard way as well. Okay, so that's one concept of a build. There are different ways of effectively doing the same thing, and there are good reasons for doing it differently. There are different requirements, different constraints. Uh, we also need to think about what can go wrong. So, what can go wrong when making tea? Well, we can put too little or too much water in with the uh, tea in the pot. You know, if you put too little in, you will actually end up with very uh, bitter, strong tea. Uh, if you brew too long, you will typically end up with very bitter tea. You do not want to drink that. Uh, you might forget to empty the pot, which means that you've still got tea leaves in the pot, and you end up with bitter, undrinkable tea. So you get the idea. You basically end up with something you can't drink. Um, and this can easily happen when a person is doing this. I've done it far too many times. You get distracted, you're checking your Twitter stream or what have you, and then you forget that you've actually got some tea on. So what we're able to do is to automate to eliminate human error. You know, it's uh, dropping the cards on the floor or punching the wrong cards, you, uh, holes in a card. You know, that's human error. And it happens all the time. It's like how many steps of building your software are you actually doing something manual? Every time you're doing that, you're introducing scope for error and potentially just disrupting the whole flow of your system. So people are fallible. Um, muscle memory does help, but actually in software development and building software, muscle, I've never known a case where muscle memory helps. You don't do a task repetitively enough to actually build the muscle memory. Or if you do, once you've done it, the build changes, and then you've lost all of the benefit there. So we don't want, we want as little human involvement as possible. So that's automation. Now let's think, what if your job depended on perfect tea every time? Um, I was actually thinking, it's like, what if your, you, your boss uh, insisted that you make perfect tea, otherwise you're gonna get rid of you? That makes no sense. So let's imagine you have a tea shop. You have, at one time, come up with the perfect tea. Somebody came in, a critic, had that tea, and suddenly your place is incredibly popular. Um, but if you can no longer make that perfect tea, traffic goes down, you don't make as much money. So, you need to think about what's going in to your uh, build, or in this case, making tea, uh, and what the parameters are. So what I'm talking about here is, uh, you know, how much, exactly how much water should we be putting into the teapot? Um, what type of tea? That's the, the input. Are you using tea leaves or tea bags? Um, you know, how much tea? These are all inputs. How much water you transfer, I would class as a parameter of the build, not necessarily a, a, a basic input. The quality of the water would consist of being a build input. Um, and ultimately, you know, how long are you going to brew for? Again, this would class a build parameter. So you basically got these inputs and parameters. So if you're going to make the perfect tea, one, you need to remember what the inputs and parameters were at that point in time. And then you need to make sure that if you set those same inputs and parameters, you will get exactly the same output. So perhaps with making tea you think this is obvious, it will just happen automatically. 
But it could be environment specific. What if you uh, have to go up a uh, Mount Everest, for whatever reason, uh, to make tea for somebody? What's the problem at the top of Mount Everest when it comes to making tea? The temperature at which the water boils. It's much lower because your pressure is much lower. Air pressure is much lower. So you're actually not going to boil properly and therefore you're not going to brew properly. So actually our build is inherently environment dependent. And this is something that happens in software all the time. Um, and it means that my build is no longer repeatable. I've gone to the top of a mountain, I cannot make the perfect tea. Uh, we've all seen it in software development. Uh, how many times have people come across the, it works for me, and then discovered it's because they have a dependency in their local maven cache, and everybody else does not. Yes, I've done that, been there. Everyone, I think, has uh, come across it. Uh, that is not a repeatable build. So this is something that is important, and again, especially in software, think about, okay, so we've got a customer on a really old version of a particular application, and it's not working, they've got this bug. Well, nobody, you know, nobody has that version of the application anymore, so how are you going to rebuild it so that you can actually determine what's wrong? A tag in your source control is only part of the solution. The other part is when you build that tag, you're getting exactly what the customer has. If you do not have repeatable builds, that's off the table. You have no guarantees. So that's why that is important. And then let's think, what if we are running our little tea shop or cafe and we need to make lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of tea? Uh, we can invest in uh, equipment. Uh, actually, I, has anyone heard of any automated tea making machines? Yes. Where? Who? Uh, what? They, I mean, they, I've seen that they, the teas that they make are together for. Oh, okay. <laughs> so they don't use automatic tea machines. But if they worked, you know, if you can have automatic bread makers, my mind was completely blown the first time I came across a bread maker. Uh, you put in flour, uh, yeast, water, and you just leave it, and it actually produces a good loaf of bread, better generally than you'll get in a supermarket. So it's automated and you will get consistent bread as long as you put the right amounts in. Um, it'd be ideal to have something like that for tea as well. I'm sure they must have it in Japan. I mean, they automate everything in Japan. Okay, so if you're going to have to make lots of teas, speed and efficiency is very useful because uh, you're limited by speed and efficiency and how much tea you can um, produce. Now, automating some of this will help, uh, possibly uh, using pressure cooker or equivalent so you boil the water quickly. These are, these are factors in individual tasks, and to be honest, a build system, because I'm really talking about build systems, can't help them. You know, individual tasks, steps, have a specified amount of time they will take. Uh, you can work on those to make sure they're faster. But in a more general sense, if we want faster stuff, we can also work on task avoidance. So um, you don't want to boil the kettle if it's already hot enough to actually make the tea. You don't want to have to go and empty the teapot only to find there's no tea in there. You've just wasted some time doing that. So those kinds of uh, examples. And this comes down to incremental build. You know, check, does a step actually need to execute? If you don't need to execute it, you save time. Okay, so ultimately, a build should be automated, repeatable, and preferably as fast as possible. Because we are, as software developers, you know, who doesn't run a build every day? when they're working. Possibly not at the weekends, which is fair enough. If you're an open source developer, it's done at the weekends as well. Um, you, you want that process to be as fast as possible. Okay, so that's what we want out of the build system. And that's what we want out of our builds. And that is really the fundamental point of this talk, is understanding 
why builds should have those three particular aspects, attributes, facets. So how does Gradle help with this stuff? Uh, let's look at automation to begin with. So um, a lot of stuff is already done out of the box for us, the Java plugin and uh, everything like that. So actually you don't need to do much yourself in order to build software and get reproducible results. But what if you want to do something completely different? So uh, the Grails user guide project is a Gradle build. The reason we can do that is because it's so easy to create these custom tasks. Uh, and we can automate all of those. We can even make some of these things optional because they're slow. Like fetching the Grail source and then creating the API docs. Uh, if you want to grab that project, just try it out. It adds a, a few minutes to your build. So we don't want to do that every time. Uh, so again, we're showing that the task graph, that fundamental model, is ideal pretty much for any type of build that we want to undertake. So custom tasks are trivially easy. Um, I'm actually assuming who hasn't used Gradle here? Or is it fairly new to it? Okay. So, um, I mean, this call here is mostly for you guys. So, you've got different ways of doing it. You can do it in a build file. That is the first example. We are defining a new task called publish guide. And inside there, we can just have some code, some groovy code, that generates HTML from uh, these GDoc files. Now, we could do that all manually, or we could use a class from a library that happens to be on the class path. That's fine. You're not limited. You're not restricted. But where Gradle really shines, I feel, is not only... Because if you write all your custom tasks in the build file, you end up with those massive... You remember Ant and why maybe we, some of us liked switching to Maven? I'll admit it. I liked Maven too when I first came across it. Um, a, it made sense compared to Maven 1, uh, but also, you know, build files, relatively speaking, were less complicated. There were, every build didn't do something different, which is what happened with Ant. So you, you don't really want a heavily polluted build file. So you can actually create task classes. So these are in separate files. So in Gradle, if you have a build SRC directory in the root of your project, you can put uh, tasks in there or any code that you want available to the build itself. And then, if you want, if you've got like published guide, you want to use that in other projects, then we can package it in a jar file and make it available either as a plain jar or as a Gradle plugin. Uh, and each step of the way, you don't have to go straight to this. You can do that, factor it out, and then factor it out again. And each of those is a relatively straightforward step. Uh, if you want to make, so I, I said, API docs and fetching the Grail source for expensive operations, uh, especially on a 33.6k modem, <coughs> then you'll be waiting an hour. Um, you can do things like API docs is that task. Every task has an only if method. And we can say, only execute this task if the disabled or Ruby docs uh, system property is not, doesn't have a value. Okay? So, conditional task execution. And that's, that's one example of a completely custom build doing something different. But of course, remember the advanced Java build is doing lots of other things. You can add tasks into an existing Java build or a standard Groovy application. You have your standard bits, <coughs> but then you can still do custom steps very easily. Um, thing, integration tests, creating documentation, uh, sometimes deployment, or uploading to Artifactory, or, or what have you. And fundamentally, please, 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 stop using scripts outside of your build system to do build-related things. Because every time you do stuff outside of the build, you're actually uh, eliminating the benefits of automation, because you have to remember to run those scripts. Uh, you have to remember how to use those scripts as well. You know, you want to basically automate everything. Okay, so that's automation. Um, and that is kind of a big thing that build tools do. What about repeatable tools? 
Now, the repeatability depends heavily on the tasks themselves. As I said, when you boil the kettle, it depends whether you're up the top of the mountain or at sea level. It's actually affected by the environment. Every time you have a task that accesses a system property or an environment variable, it's become environment dependent. There is nothing that Gradle can do for you if this is the case. Um, you just need to be aware of what you're doing to your build when you do this. Okay? Um, and there are other things like, uh, you know, the number of cores in, on your processor. You know, if you've got one or multiple ones, your build may change based on that. Uh, the order of the tests may change depending on which computer you run on, whether you're running on Windows or Linux or whatever. Um, so those kinds of things Gradle doesn't really help with. But thinking about the um, ordering of, t of tests, sometimes when you've got something like the uh, making tea, you can run those tasks in parallel, there's no guarantee on the order that the tasks run. Okay? So you could boil the kettle before you empty the pot, or vice versa. And it could do different things on different platforms. And that's fine, possibly, but it may possibly not be fine. And so that's where Gradle can help, is when you don't want dependencies between tasks, but you do want to control the ordering of the tasks. And this is where some methods called must run after, should run after come into play. So let's consider an example here. This is a real life example. Um, this is a, of the Lazy Brains project. I have integration tests. I have a task for running the integration tests. It is a custom task. I also have one to package the reports as a zip file. Uh, this is because if you use something like Drone.io, the <coughs> continuous integration server, they don't make test reports automatically available to you, but they will make binary zip files and stuff in your um, build output available to you to download. So I want to package all the test reports. But I don't want to always package test reports when I run integration tests. Or if I run package reports, I don't want it necessarily to run an integration test or even the unit test. But I do want to make sure that this runs after that. Sorry. And that's where uh, must run after comes in. Okay? Should run after is less strict. Um, I'm still unsure exactly the benefit of it, but it's, um, there are certain circumstances where um, you may not get the ordering you've just requested, which should run after. It's to do with parallel project execution, uh, and there's another example as well. Um, the it, it's a great example of should. So you would like to boil after you empty the pot because otherwise the water might be a little bit colder than you like. But if it happens, it does. It's, it's not. It's not a disaster. Okay. Yes. Good point. So uh, the example there was from back from the tea. Uh, you should. You would like to boil the kettle after you've emptied the pot because if you empty the pot after you boil the kettle, there's a gap while the water is cooling down. Um, so that's a should run after, but it may not be critical unless you want the perfect tea, in which case have to be a must so run after. On the but that's a, that's a general concept. Yeah. Within Gradle, though, the, actually where should run after and must run after make a difference is uh, a little obscure yeah. to my mind, but it's available. Uh, generally speaking, must run after is very useful. You can also specify that uh, like, every time you run integration tests, package reports will be run as well and run after it. And that's what Finalize 5 does. Ensures that you run this task after that one. Actually, that happens even if this fails. So if integration tests fail, package reports will still run. Okay? So Finalize 5 is often used to clean up resources. So this is helping us with repeatable builds. Um, but there's a bigger issue, and I kind of alluded to it already when I talked about how many people have come across the it works for me because I have something in the local maven cache. Uh, dependency issues. I, dependency hell. We all know it's dependency hell. 
Um, but it doesn't matter, some people say, oh, I wish we could go back to putting jars in the lib directory. It would be so much saner um, and forgetting about how hard it was to make sure that you fetched all the right jar files. Oh my god. Uh, dependency issues are just a problem. And Java doesn't particularly help with, with no module system. Um, you know, we're using conventions like putting the version of a jar into its file name. That is such a broken concept. But it's all we've got. It is all we've got. Um, so the Maven cache is a uh, very common problem. But there are other ones, such as you get your dependencies from a remote repository. But the same dependency may be available in different remote repositories. So if you've got two groups using different versions, different remote repositories, they may be getting different binaries when they build your project. It happens apparently in the enterprise because we're not perfect. The systems that we set up are not perfect. Uh, Maven had massive issues because POMs were badly written or just played wrong. Um, and you know, you had to live with these. People set up their own custom repositories, artifact repositories, just so they could provide fixed POMs. You know, and get reliable builds. So there are all sorts of issues around this stuff. And the big one with Gradle is its cache. And this is completely unlike the Maven local cache. Um, it has origin checks. So basically, every time it downloads a binary, a jar file, it will also store where it got it with the build. So to ensure when you run that uh, build, you're not picking up the accidentally picking up that jar file from a different remote repository. Okay. Um, it also stores checksums with each of the binaries, so that you don't get that issue where two jars, same name, uh, same version, different classes or different different versions of classes. So, you know, if there's any differences between the binaries, it will fail on the checksum. Uh, it's also concurrency safe. You can always specify Maven local as a place to get your binaries from. Don't do it unless you know what you're doing. Or actually, just don't do it. Don't do it unless you really, 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 really have to. Um, possibly integrating with Maven is, is one reason. But because the Maven cache has none of this, it's very easy to run into the same problems that we're trying to eliminate. You will still get the, it works for me, just because accidentally you've got a binary in your main, local Maven cache. Okay? So Maven local should be avoided like the plague, unless there's a very, very good reason. There is a, one issue with Gradle cache. It, because it's kind of sophisticated stuff and it's very encapsulated from you as a developer, you cannot manipulate it directly. So when, sometimes you do want to, de to delete one of the jars from the cache to trigger re-resolving it from the remote cache, which you can easily do with main and local because main and local cache is very stupid. So here there is yeah. no API. Yeah. So that you, I, I would expect a common line API for removing. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that, that that may come. So yes, you can't manipulate the cache to fix it. Although actually, I think I have deleted entries from it because no. I know where to find them. Yeah. But it's so. it's a very it's a more complex structure, yeah. and so so doing, you are being a little bit risky. But then again, manually manipulating a local cache is risky in and of itself. So um, yes, you might consider it a, a weakness. Broken but download. It's, yeah. That's a very common example when you want to remove the partially download file from the local cache. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the Gradle cache, but actually within your build, you have some control as well. So I don't know how many people have come across this yet, but you can control the resolution strategy, how Gradle decides what to do when your class path has multiple versions of a single dependency. Um, by default, Gradle will use the newest, um, which works reasonably well, it would just automatically evict all the other versions and just give you the newest one. Uh, there are some issues with this. 
When you go between major versions, people like to break their libraries between major versions. Some people like to break versions at the minor level as well. Um, not thinking of SRF2J, for example. I had lots of uh, joy when they switched. I think it was 1.5 to 1.6. They actually broke the API. And so, if you had both, if you uh, some things would not work with 1.6 if they've been compiled with 1.5. So, you know, you're used to all this eviction happening automatically, but it's also the kind of thing where it can go horribly, horribly wrong. And then, how the hell do you find out why these things are going wrong? Um, so, by default, you get the newest, but you can also specify fail on version conflict. To be honest, I, I almost feel that I would like this to be the default because it will ensure that you will error out if you ever have two versions of the same library uh, collected in a single configuration, say the com compilation configuration. It forces you to sort out, either specify precisely which version you want across the whole build or that you specify proper exclusions or any of these things. But it ensures that whenever something changes with a dependency, you will know straight away. The automatic dependency resolution is the clever solution. I'm starting to get annoyed with clever solutions because they invariably make my life harder later when things go wrong. So this is one option that you can take. So the false is like every time uh, ASM is a, in your dependency graph, it will be changed to 3.3.1. Um, so, yeah, that's just an explanation of what those do. We can also do some more interesting things. Another common issue, especially as Groovy developers, is that we have two different modules, different names, same classes. Groovy, Groovy all. I have run into issues where I have two different versions, Groovy All 2.1.9, Groovy 1.8. Same with Spring, by the way. Same with uh, issues with Spring as well, because any, any system that has modules, you can like have the big fat Spring jar, or you can have individual modules. Um, any time that you have those coming together, life is going to be hell, because Java doesn't mind you having multiple jars with the same classes on the class path. It actually doesn't mind you having the same jars with the same name on the class path. It will just hit the first jar in the class path that it finds that has the classes. You've made your, if you've got that happening, say that even if you just have Groovy 2.1 and Groovy 2.0 on your class path, then um, Java doesn't care, and on different platforms, you may have different ordering. So your application may be using 2.0, or it may be using 2.1, depending on your platform. One may work, uh, and the other may not. And you've just got yourself a problem that's hard to diagnose, unless you have a nice script that dumps your class path out. So you can actually see what jars are being included. So you actually have the power to go through the dependency graph and say, ah, there's a groovy all. I want to use the groovy dependency. So that's what this does. It ensures that every dependency is Groovy module rather than Groovy all, and then the automatic conflict resolution kicks in, or you get a failure based on versions. So this is very powerful. It is complex, but dependencies are complex and difficult because of the nature of uh, Java's module system, if you can call it that. Like Yes, as I said, if you can even call it a module system. Um, hey, Jigsaw will save us when it comes out uh, with uh, version 21. Today. Yeah, you saw this tweet? I saw a tweet. There, there, was a, there was a tweet, if, uh, for those that weren't following. Um, somebody said, ah, oh, right, uh, it, was, sure it was kind of a future tweet. I'm liking, ah, <laughs> oh, Java 20 is, is pretty good, and in Java 21 we're going to finally get Jigsaw. <laughs> Uh, Jigsaw has been on the roadmap for ever since. It was going to go in 7, then it was going to go in 8, then it's going in 9, who knows. And to be honest, it, it's even doubtful whether it will solve any of this. It may not even be a generic module system like Gems Ruby. 
And even then, you know, you talk to a Ruby developer, they talk about gem help. So it doesn't, even with proper module systems, dependencies are opaque. Uh, right. And then, of course, when things do go wrong, you want to make sure that you are able to work out why they're going wrong. Uh, and that's where you may already, you should already know the dependencies task, and that will list out all of the dependencies in your project uh, for like the compilation uh, configuration, the test configuration, runtime, and so forth. Dependency Insights is a newer one. I can't remember which version it uh, appeared in. Uh, more recent one of Gradle. This will allow you to specify, I have a problem with the Groovy jar. Tell me where Groovy is being pulled in from. You know, which where is it a transitive dependency? How many versions of it are being pulled in? That's what Dependency Insight tells you. So it's a useful diagnostic tool. So that's the thing, you've got automatic conflict resolution, but you always need diagnostic tools as well, because things do go wrong. Yes? There is also the uh, versions plugin. Okay, that's the Gradle versions plugin. I saw you tweet something about that recently. Yeah, yeah the Gradle versions plugin can give you a list of uh, the two, your current dependencies, if they match a current milestone, or if they're behind, or they are ahead. Oh, okay, yes, I remember, yeah. So, um, uh, Andres is talking about the versions plugin, which will allow you to uh, run it against your current dependencies and say like whether you are running against the latest, whether the newer versions available. Uh, I think it does some other things. So that gives you some diagnostics as well, um, and also uh, helps in the whole upgrade to new uh, versions. But doing it automatically, always be wary of automatically updating to the latest and greatest, because some jars break, new versions break things. You know, if it's working, don't fix. Well, a broke, you don't fix. Uh, so that's debugging uh, dependencies. Uh, this is a this is a way to actually see what jar files are going to be on your class path. So this is all configurations. You can say configurations.compile.files and actually see what the jars are. So that that will give you the option of seeing whether you're getting double Groovy or Groovy all and Groovy modules. Very important for diagnostics. So that's the repeatability side of things. Um, fast build execution, well, again, that depends on your tasks. Uh, how long do they take to execute? Well, uh, Gradle can't do much about that. Uh, you cannot currently run tasks in parallel. Uh, there are ways to run, you can run tests in parallel if your tests are happy to be run in parallel. Uh, but generic running tasks in parallel uh, doesn't happen. You can run projects in parallel. But remember, parallelization introduces difficulties at this time. Um, that's one way of uh, improving speed, but the core one is task avoidance, incremental build. It all comes down to this little chappy here, up to date, meaning that it didn't have to run the task. And that happens quickly. And in order to get that, you know, the Java plugin does a lot of this stuff for you, but what if you have a custom task uh, John actually mentioned it in his talk, he gave an example. Uh, you can specify task inputs and outputs. You can say this is a required part, to re uh, an input of the task. If it changes, then my task needs to rerun. If it doesn't change, it doesn't need to rerun. So just by having an annotation, input file or app input, you can specify uh, what's required to run it, and when it actually needs to run, and when it doesn't need to run. So this is a very powerful feature, and it shows you how easy it is to get your own custom tasks incorporated into the incremental build system. Um, John's example actually showed using the uh, Gradle DSL. So within a, um, in the build script, you can actually say there's this inputs uh, property and outputs property, and you can explicitly say uh, one of the, this file is an input. You don't have to use annotations. I just find this the simplest. Approach. And it is good to uh, factor out your tasks into individual classes. I think this is very good practice. Uh, okay, so I'm going to really uh, finish up now. So I've talked about automation, repeatability, and fast execution as fundamental attributes we want from our builds. Uh, but there are other things you need to think about. Who is going to be using the build? Is it always the same people? Uh, what do they actually need in order to use your build? 
Do they need to set up all sorts of subsystems? Uh, will they be using the whole of the build? You know, uh, I've got an example, and, and how long does the whole thing take? Do you need a wiki page to explain how to run your build? Which probably means you've got a bunch of manual steps in there. Um, how long is that wiki page? These are important questions. Every time you've got a long wiki page, you're actually making it harder for people to build your software. Uh, so, thinking about who is going to be running my build, think about user categories. You know, in LazyBase, anybody can build it, compile it, package it, and install it locally and run it. But they cannot publish it. So, I can very easily, so I am going a little quickly now, uh, I can specify that once the task graph is finished, if somebody is trying to execute the published tasks, then check whether they've got the credentials in order to publish it. So this means that if you're not going to publish, you do not need to specify these credentials. It's absolutely not required. But if you do run the task, you do need these credentials, and I want the build to fail if you don't have those credentials. I want it to fail fast. So this is a very, very powerful concept in Green. You can also conditionally, um, uh, these are other examples, include class obfuscation conditionally. Uh, you can make sure that publish is only available if you have the right role. You can hook into uh, an LDAP server, perhaps, that kind of thing. Um, so, all sorts of options there. And finally, some more uh, attributes of a build. It should have features. Those tasks are features in effect. You do want error reporting because you're running these things, you want to know when things are not working and why they're not working. Um, and there's this internal model of the process, the, the task graph itself. And to be honest, this reminds me of any other piece of software that we write. So actually think about your build as a piece of software, but also that it actually needs a decent level of investment of time and uh, effort just to make sure that you know, it's always going to run quickly, efficiently, and you're not going to be scratching your head for days on end, just like when you're debugging your application or library. Okay, so in summary, uh, your process is an end-to-end, -end, uh, build is an end-to-end -end process, so maybe going from the source files, from source control, all the way through to deployment. Um, generally speaking, you know, 80-20 rule could kind of apply. It depends on the project, but uh, it's often a standard build plus a lot of custom, some custom stuff that only applies to your project. And it works for this 20%, you will spend 80% of your time. Uh, quite possibly, <laughs> yes, because the Java plugin, which covers the 80%, should just work out of the box. Um, always make sure that you automate everything and uh, yeah, invest in the build as a part of your project. It's a core part of your project. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Um, we've got, uh, if you have any questions, well, yeah, if you have any questions, come to me after this. Otherwise, you can go straight to lunch. I don't want to keep you from the uh, lunch. So thank you very much, and it's lovely talking to you, and I'm doing well. Talk later. Maybe I'll see you there. Okay, thank you.